Let's bow for prayer for a moment. Father, thank You that You hold us fast in the palm of Your hand. We are grateful for how You've spoken to us already today through the various other parts of our, our gathering. And now we come to Scripture, to Your Word. May the Spirit who inspired this Word take it, apply it to all of our hearts. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to begin by telling you about my morning today. Didn't go as planned. Uh, the church here told me I need to be here on a Sunday morning at 7.20 just to get ready, the things that need to be done. And we live about an hour away, and so I've got to leave home 6.15, 6.20. Um, got up this morning about 4.30 and uh, went down to our family room, put on a light in the, in the kitchen. It's a single recessed light, like you have recessed lights. It's, there's a single and there's a circuit with a few lights on it. But I put on the single, made coffee, sat down, and I'm reading and I'm reflecting and I'm getting ready for the service. Um, at about 5.30, 5.25, I remembered that Sharon, my wife, had said, waken me at 5.30, please, because when I go home today, we're going to have a birthday celebration for uh, grandchild number three in succession who turned six this week. And so there are families gathering at our house. And when I say family, that's six adults, myself and Sharon, our two daughters, their two husbands, and five grandchildren. And, and our common practice on a birthday week is whoever's birthday was that week, we gather on Sunday. Now, she had a party with her friends earlier in the week, but we gather, and that person gets to choose the food that we will have, which is always interesting when it's a six-year-old choosing Sunday lunch. Um, so we kind of help counsel and advise that choice. So Sharon said, wake me at 5.30 because I got stuff to get ready. So I did that. I took her up hot tea to bed. Now, you need to know I do that every single morning when I'm home. It's usually at 6, so today was at 5.30. It, it's, it's only probably here in North America that I have to say hot tea. <laughs> you know, tea is supposed to be hot. <laughs> in our countries, we just say tea. We came here, and we were out somewhere, maybe at a restaurant, and Sharon, typically Sharon would say, I'll say I love coffee, she'll say I love tea, and the server would say, hot or cold or iced, and that's, that's a foreign language to us. So just so you know, there's, there's tea, real tea, and there's your tea. And so <laughs> I take Sharon hot tea, and, and one reason I do that, other than being just an incredible, wonderful husband, not is Sharon has fibromyalgia, and mornings are really challenging for her. And this has been her journey for the last 20 years. Her body aches, usually in the morning, she awakens with a lot of ache, and so sometimes she'll have to take some pain medication, but tea, hot tea, helps to get her going. So I did that, 5.30, I went downstairs, I, you know, I finished my, some notes I was making, closed my Bible, and as I was getting ready to go upstairs to get dressed, the single light that I'd left burning in the kitchen went off. I thought, oh, bulb is blown. So I went over and I flicked the other switch, which has the five lights on, and they didn't come on. Now, the lamp where I was sitting was on, but these wouldn't come on, so I went to the hallway and they wouldn't come on. And, and then I noticed the stove time. You know the clock in your stove uh, range? What, what do you call it here? Is it a stove? Range? Cooker? We call it a cooker. <sighs> which is different from the cook, um, it was off, but the microwave was on, the light in the microwave. So I started trying various switches and discovered some were on, some were off. It wasn't a single circuit. It was some that were plugged into outlets, but some lights. And then the one single light that had gone off came back on, but really dim. Then the lights in the hallway that hadn't come on came on, but really dim. So I went up to Sharon and said, honey, I'm getting ready to go to church. Something's happening in the house with electric. And I went to the breaker box, and you know, I did all the stuff you're supposed to do. Couldn't, couldn't see any problem. And I have no idea 
No idea what was going on. So I left her with that, getting ready for the birthday party. And I kind of felt like Peter felt on the day of Pentecost. Because there'd been this sudden infusion of power, the power of the Holy Spirit, that caused the people who were seeing the outcomes to say, what's going on? You find the story in Acts chapter 2. I encourage you to, to read it. Yeah, you may be wanting to hear the end of the story, which I'll tell you next week about the party, but I did text her between services and say, any updates? And uh, our, our, one of our daughters and husband lived next door to us, so the plan was the party would be there, so she'd call them to say, is your power on? Anything weird happening? I said, no, it's fine. We're, we're good. So we are to go there. But the update between services was they're experiencing the same thing, which made me feel better that they're having trouble too. Because then it's not just our house, it's got to be in the supply system somewhere. So we'll see what happens when I get home. I think it's going to be pizza. <laughs> but Peter is listening to the crowd in Acts chapter 2 and verse 12. We got to this part last week. You see what it says? Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? They are experiencing something that is beyond their comprehension. They had gathered from all over the empire. They're in Jerusalem. They speak different languages. The Spirit of God has come upon the disciples. The disciples are now speaking in the language of these other people that they previously didn't know, couldn't speak. I can just imagine the, the babble of all of these utterances as these disciples are speaking in these languages, and the hearers say, what, what's going on? What, what's happening? What does this mean? Peter tries to answer the question, but look at verse 13 before we get to 12. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Now, I remember there's thousands of people around, and there's these individuals who are um, speaking and uttering in multiple languages that they don't know. So whatever chaotic experience causes some people, perhaps with a good sense of humor, who says, they're drunk. They're drunk. And I would expect Peter maybe to say, no, that's not true. You know, we don't, we're not drinkers. We don't consume alcohol, of course. You know, whatever his answer would have been. His answer is also somewhat interesting when we get down to it. Verse 14, Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice and addressed the crowd and said, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose, because it's only nine in the morning. The implication being, if it was eight o'clock at night, <laughs> might be a different story. Maybe I'm reading more into the text. I'm sure I am. So Peter denies this allegation of drunkenness, and then he tries to give an answer to something that I suggest to you he didn't really even understand himself fully. What's his answer? Verse 16, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And if we had time, we would go back to Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and onwards, where you find this, these words that Peter is now quoting. In the last days, God says. It's good that we pause there. When Peter quotes Joel, he doesn't do it correctly. Which is just an interesting phenomena that happens multiple times in the New Testament, that when New Testament preachers, speakers, writers are referencing an Old Testament Scripture, they don't get it right. Now, I say I don't get it right. You might think, I mean, they got it wrong, but that's not really what I'm saying, is they were familiar with it, but they're interpreting it in a way that was different than it was first intended. Because when Joel wrote, Joel didn't say, in the last days. That's not found in Joel. If you go back to Joel, Again, depending on your translation, what Joel said was, afterward, these things will happen. He did not say, in the last days. And Joel was particularly writing in his context about the people of God returning to their promised land and to Jerusalem, to the place that God had given them, and he's talking about things that will happen because the Jewish people had been dispersed. And so he's speaking in his historical context 
But Peter interprets it, inspired by the Spirit of God, I believe, to reinterpret it and even to misquote it. And he says, in the last days. And this phrase, in the last days, has caused the Christian church, me, you, most of us, to wrestle with what does that mean? It's 2,000 years ago. In the last days? 2,000 years ago. Is that what it means? Well, if we read it to mean literally last days, we, we misunderstand what Peter is saying. It's not what he meant. When the Scriptures talk about the last days, they sometimes talk about the former and the last. They're actually talking about this stream of human history that has been divided by the coming of the Messiah, the former and the latter, the before and the after, those that were and those that are. And we live in the last days, but it wasn't intended to be this chronological alarm clock that says we're getting close to midnight. That's not what it meant. It simply means that you and I, as Peter is going to explain, are living after a history-dividing event. It's a watershed. This history-dividing event of the coming of the Messiah, His life, His teachings, His death, His resurrection, and now the coming of the Spirit separates human history into the before and the after, and we are living in this period of time. And one of the one of the challenges that we as Christians have is sometimes we read things that are the way they used to be rather than the way they are. We don't live back there. We don't live in the Old Testament. We don't live under the Old Testament covenant. We don't live under the Old Testament promises. Some of them, of course, are still applicable and still relevant, but many of them are not. We're living in the after. So that's how Peter sets up his answer. So remember the question, what does this mean? Here's his answer, verse 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. That is a huge watershed for the church. Then, in the Old Testament, in the past, the Spirit of God was not poured out on all people. It was a select few and it was sporadic, and it was time-limited. Most of the people were prophets, priests, and kings. You read through the Old Testament, you'll talk about this, or we'll talk about the Spirit of the Lord came upon whoever, and it was usually one of those people, a prophet, priest, or king, and often for a specific thing that they had to do. And then later, the Spirit might come back, and the Spirit might come back. So selected people at selected times for selected purposes. But now, in our day, in this day, Peter says, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Remember what Luke told us last week in Acts chapter 1, verses 8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. This watershed event of the Spirit coming, it comes on all people. I want to be clear, that's not to say that every single human being, regardless of he or who she is, will experience the coming of the Spirit of God. There is a response on our part to receive. We'll come to that in a moment. This is not a, a universalism that every human being just gets the Spirit of God in them regardless of who they are or what they do. That's not what he's saying. What he's actually saying is that no one is excluded from what God wants to do. And he begins to list some of the common divisions that they thought limited how God would work. Verse 17, I'll pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. That's a new thing. That's a new day. It's not just sons, it's daughters. In a society where it was expected that men alone would have the Spirit of God and serve in that way. It says, no, the coming of the Spirit is for men and women, sons and daughters. No division by sex. As a father of daughters only, I'm glad for that. I'm glad that my two daughters have equal access to the Spirit of God. I don't have sons. I have sons-in-law, and they're okay. But you know, the, the, 
Um, the, the coming of the Spirit is for sons and daughters. There's no difference. There's no separation. And it is interesting, we'll see later on, he comes back to that separation a second time. It's the only one that he comes back to a second time. It's not your sons, or it would be your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. We're familiar in, in our English culture and language of the term elders. There's a reason people were called elders. Can you guess? They were old. They were old. This, this, this giving appropriate respect and value to those who were old because they've lived life, they've been there, they've done that, they've seen it, they've lived through it, they have wisdom, they have experience in theory. Elders. But Peter says, you're young men. They're going to have these visions and dreams. It's not an age differential. It's for all. It's for men and for women, your sons and your daughters, your young men and your old men. And, and by the way, where's the line that you cross from being young to old? It's always about five years older than what I am. You know, it just keeps moving as you get closer. It just keeps moving up. But it's your old men and your young men, even on my servants, so not a class distinction. Now, whether God is referring to everyone as servants or whether it's the class distinction within their culture of servants, even slaves and owners, even my servants. And then he returns, verse 18, both men and women. I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and they will prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Verse 21, and everyone, everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Prior to this, there was this sense of exclusivity. We are God's chosen people. We are special. God speaks to us. God comes to us. And even within that, they had distinctions of male and female. Jewish men, every morning, one of their prayers, I thank God that I am not a woman. That's how many Jewish prayers were started. Peter says, we don't live like that any longer. We live in the now. The Spirit has come. The Spirit is poured out on all flesh, all people. That's repeated. Sons and daughters, young and old, servants, everyone. The Spirit has come. And so this this growing awareness in the life of this early church that God was taking them from this exclusive group that they were to be something much bigger and better and grander and diverse. It's beginning to happen. It's beginning to dawn on them. Let's jump a few verses. Verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now, Peter preaches a longer sermon. I, I went from the beginning to the end, but we have this response. These people are baptized. But do you see what it says just before that in verse 37? When the people heard this, the sermon of Peter, they were cut to the heart. I grew up in a church context in Northern Ireland where it was expected that the Spirit of God would bring conviction of sin upon people. Conviction of sin is this deep heart awareness that I am a sinful person who has broken God's law, I'm far from God, and I feel the weight of my sin, my brokenness, my lostness. That was the culture that I was brought up in. It was expected and fairly normal that at the end of church services, people might come to an altar real, kneelingly like this and spend time confessing their sin because they were cut to the heart. I did that on many occasions, often with tears. 
Today, we've kind of lost some of that. Today, the Christian gospel is sometimes only framed in the good news, which it is. The gospel is good news. That's what it means. And we focus on, if you come to God, God will do this and this and this and this and this for you. And it's the good aspect, which is true. But I long for the day that people are cut to the heart with their sin, their distance from God's will, their brokenness, their lostness. And I'm not just talking about those who have never come to know Jesus. I'm talking about Christians too. I'm talking about people who have said, Lord Jesus, come into my life and forgive my sin and make me a child of God. But they continue in lives with patterns of sin where they're not living out who they are called to be. And maybe today you're like that. And if we had a testimony time, you could say, Alan, there's this or this or this or this in my life that I know is not what God wants. I would love, I long that God's Spirit would move on our congregations, and I'm not speaking of the brethren in Christ, including Andrew, and that people would be cut to the heart with their sin. And that's what happened here. And when they were cut to the heart, they said to Peter, still in verse 37, what shall we do? What shall we do? The necessity of the human response to the conviction of God. The necessity that it's not enough just to experience God speaking to us and convicting us and showing us our need, but that we respond to God. What shall we do? Peter answers the question, repent and be baptized, every one of you. And repent, I am sure you know, is this acknowledging our sin and turning away from it and walking toward God and walking in His light. Repent, be baptized, every one of you. And we're told that verses 40 and 41, many accepted His message, 3,000 people added to the church. I'm not a math person, but I'm told to go from the 120 that were in the upper room to the 3,120, assuming it was exactly 3,000 and not just a number to represent the bigness of it, is is 26-fold multiplication. I didn't do the math. I just read that somewhere. If you're a math person and you're doing it in your head, you don't need to come and tell me I'm wrong. It's okay. But this huge expansion of the church and the first Christian church, Christian meaning after the death, resurrection of Jesus, the first Christian church after the first service on its first day becomes a mega church that is multicultural and multilingual. That's something to think about. We, we started in Revelation last week just for a bit where it says that on that day, God will bring those, the church from every tribe and language and tongue and nation. This is the beginning of it. Multicultural, multilingual, people who have experienced new life in Jesus, this is the church. We're going to skip a couple of chapters at a time, but let's look at the end of chapter 2, beginning at verse 42. We're not going to read it all but you have a description of what this new church is like. In spite of its diversity, multilingual, multicultural, multi-ethnic, remember that's who they were, in spite of all of that, it tells us they're all together. Look at verse 44 of chapter 2. All the believers were together, they had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods, and they gave to everyone as he had need, etc., etc., etc. Jump to the end of chapter 4 you find an almost identical summary of this church, almost identical at the end of chapter 4. The believers, verse 32, all the believers were one in heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of his possessions were his own, but they shared everything they had with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Much grace was upon them. There was no needy persons among them. Remember that phrase. I'll come back to it in a moment. There was no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses They sold them, they brought the money from the sale, they put it at the apostles' feet, it was distributed to anyone as he had need. So two times, the end of chapter 2, the end of chapter 4, we have this picture of the church is growing and everybody's together and it's just wonderful. We love each other, we care about each other, in spite of our multilingual, multicultural, we're, we're together. 
and it's beautiful until chapter 6. Let's go to chapter 6. Verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews. Within the Jewish culture, within the church, remember we're talking about the church. They're not called Christians yet. That comes a few chapters later. These are Messianic Jews, people who are Jewish. They recognize Yahweh and the Torah, but they've come to embrace Jesus as the Messiah. But they're divided. I shouldn't use the word divided yet. They are, they are different in their cultures. There's the Grecian Jews. Another term, depending on your translation, is Hellenistic. These are people who had probably lived outside of the home country. They had moved away, moved to another part of the empire. Maybe an ancestor generations ago had been taken captive because that had happened, and you end up living in a strange land. You remember the song, How Can We Sing the Lord's Song in a Strange Land? So you're in a strange land. You're still Jewish. You're still of the Torah. You still believe in Yahweh. You're still of the Jewish faith, but you're in a foreign culture, and you've become enculturated to that culture. You might look like them in terms of clothing or appearance in some way. You dress like them. You're like them. Those were the Grecian Hellenistic Jews. There was, the, and by the way, most of them spoke Greek because they were living in Greek-speaking countries, and over time and over generations, their language had changed. The Hebraic Jews were people who predominantly had remained living in the land, many in Jerusalem, and they kept a lot of their culture and most of their language. When I say most of the language, it wasn't Hebrew, it was likely Aramaic, which is what Jesus spoke. It was a, a dialect, it was a, a sub-language of Hebrew, Aramaic. So here are people who have their own culture, their own language, their own expectations and how things should be done, but they're still Jews. So the Greek, Grecian, Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews have both become followers of Jesus and neither in the church. And everything was wonderful for several chapters, but now there's complaining. Look at what the complaint is. They complained because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. I'm told that it was common in those days that when someone was widowed, a woman has lost her husband, her husband has died, no social security, no social network, no safety network. They didn't have those things. That it was actually common for those widows, if they lived away from Jerusalem, to return to Jerusalem, to their home country, or to the home country, because there's more of us in the home country, so there's a better chance of being cared for. So you have an influx of people, widows particularly, from other places who are now in the church in Jerusalem. And they were being cared for, and one of the things that was part of the care was give them food every day, just like the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. No refrigerators, you know, no freezers, no, or minimal capacity for the storage of food. So every day, the church would give food. Until growth, meant that the need outstripped the capacity. Because that's how it sets up at the beginning of chapter 6, verse 1. The church was increasing. So you have a limited number of people with a limited number of resources trying to meet the needs of an ever-increasing number of people. Well, how do you choose? Well, they're like us. They're the Hebraic ones. We know them. They're from here. They speak our language. They have our culture. We'll give to them first. And if we run out or we don't have time and we can't get to the next street or the next community where the Grecian widows live, well, it is what it is. That appears to be happening, and this level of division based on culture and prejudice 
has infiltrated the church, and if I read it correctly, and I encourage you to read it and tell me if you think it's right, it was the 12, the apostles, who were primarily responsible for this. At least they're blamed for it, or it seems that they're blamed for it, because they're the ones that respond with a solution. We'll come to the solution in a moment. We're not that different from these people. Oh, yeah, we're all in the church. We're all believers. We're all together. But we know there are differences among us, cultural, sometimes language, maybe not in this particular congregation, but in the church of Jesus. Skin color, nationality, politics, you name it. And sometimes those identifiers, those realities, they are realities, become more important than the ultimate reality of being one in Christ. That seems to be what's happening here. Seems to be. So there's complaints. Verse 1 is the complaint. Verse 2 is the response. The 12, the 12 disciples, apostles, gathered all the disciples together and said, and I'm going to pause before we look at what they said, but just to acknowledge, the apostles have a choice at this point. How do you respond when someone points out something to you and criticizes you and critiques you? Now, I'm going well beyond the scriptures, but I think we can identify these possibilities. One option that the 12 had, Peter and the others, would be, do you know who I am? I'm Peter. Like, I actually knew Jesus personally. I walked with him. I talked with him. He gave to me the keys of the kingdom. Or I'm James. I'm John. We are the people that Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And we left everything and followed him. Don't you dare talk to us like that. This is who we are. That could have been an option. Sometimes we respond like that when we have criticism and critique. Do you know who we are? Like, I'm the national director of the Brethren Christ Church. But another option would be to say, thank you, brother, thank you, sister, for helping me to see a blind spot that I wasn't even aware that I had. Thank you for bringing another perspective to me that If I was aware of it, I I wasn't giving it the importance that it should have had. And I'm sorry. Apologies, confessions, admissions are really hard, really hard for all of us. Have you ever struggled to admit you were wrong and give an apology? Even when you knew the critique was accurate? It's so hard, so hard. And for Peter, who just a couple of chapters earlier said all people, sons and daughters, young and old, men and women, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He has this great sermon emphasizing the all, and now he's standing accused of giving to some, neglecting others. But he has a response. It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Now, you can read that as either an arrogant statement. I'm not going to serve tables. Again, I'm Peter. That's not my role. I'm, I'm, I walked with Jesus. There's the, the, there could be, we could read that with the connotation of arrogance. Or, which is, and I don't like to read it that way. I like to read it with Peter saying, I hear you, sister, I hear you, brother, and your criticism and your critique is accurate, and we need to do something about that, and I'm so glad that God and his church gifts all of us in different ways for different purposes. We all have a role to play, and I recognize that my role is not going to help me to do that that needs to be done. How can we together solve the problem? That's how I want to read it. So, verse 3. Brothers, here's their solution. Choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them, 
and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Verse 5, the proposal pleased the whole group. It's the first and the last time that the whole church was pleased, any church with a proposal. The proposal pleased the whole church. This is a huge group. It's really hard to get that in any congregation. It's hard to get it in your own family even sometimes, no matter how small that might be. So here we have the growing pains where the, the reality of what God is doing in the world comes into conflict with this human tribalistic instinct. We acknowledge God calls all people, but we prefer people that are like us. We acknowledge that the kingdom is full of all kinds of people, all kinds of cultures, all kinds of languages, but we preference those that are like us, think like us, talk like us, act like us. This human natural instinct, which all of us have, and I have it too, people just like us. A few observations just to conclude. So what do we learn from this story together? I think the first thing I want to say, the growth of the church by reaching people who are outside of the church was critically important in the book of Acts, and it should be critically important for us today. That's my first observation. We can, we can skip over that too easily, but this story of growth and increase in reaching people needs to continue to be a passion of the church of Jesus Christ. We are called, like Jesus himself, to reach the sick and the lost and the broken and the needy. And one of the tendencies of Christian churches, and I've been around long enough to see this in multiple places, one of the tendencies of Christian churches is to become inwardly focused and satisfied with who we have. And I've been in your church here for two weeks, two services each week, and it's well filled. It's good, you know, well filled. And you can so easily get to the position of we have a good group of people, our services are well filled, our bills are paid, we're done. God says, you're not done. There's a lost world out there. There are people who need to be reached with the gospel of Jesus. And to reach them will require passion and, and intentionality and sacrifice of those who are on the inside. Lost people matter to God. They need to matter to his church. So Andrum Church, keep the fire burning bright to reach others and be willing to handle the challenges and the sacrifices that may come because of that passion. Is it worth it? Ask Jesus. He gave his life for it. That's my first observation. The second one is that tribalism is in all of us. And even when the Spirit of God comes into us and we have new birth and new life, that does not mean that the old nature, the old parts of us, the part of us that doesn't really represent the heart of God, it doesn't mean that that's gone. It's still there. And the Christian life is one of surrendering every single day to what God wants to do in our lives. And whether it's the tribalistic us and them or whether it's some other sin or need in your life, I want to guarantee you that if you've already surrendered your life to God, there will be a day, and it might be today, and it might be tomorrow, and it might be next week, where God reveals something else in your life that is not according to His will and His heart, and He's going to say to you, are you willing to surrender that to me? And you'll have the choice. And my last observation is that critique and criticism can be God's way of speaking to us. How we respond reveals our hearts. So let's be open to what God says, not just directly through His Spirit, but through one another. Let's learn to be the body that listens to each other well, even when it hurts. And in all of this, May we be a church that experiences the today, not the then, the coming of the Spirit in His fullness and His power 
to birth in us the spirit of God, the nature of God that will transform the way we live and will make a difference in our community. Let's buy for prayer. And I want to invite you as we buy for prayer to take a few moments just to prayerfully reflect and ask God if there's something in your heart or something in your life that does not reflect His heart. Are you willing to surrender that? Are there relationships that have been broken because of criticism and complaint and critique that maybe weren't given well and may not have been received well? And today there needs to be confession and apology and the making right of relationship. Or maybe we've just lost our passion for others who are not yet part of this beautiful family called the family of God. Take a moment and surrender. Pray, Holy Spirit, here I am, wholly available. As for me, I will serve the Lord. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. Amen.